But today's talk is about the overall kinetics of uh, transformation in steels. And uh, I'll explain what I mean by the overall transformation kinetics. OK, so if we look at uh, our time temperature transformation diagram, uh, then we have a variety of phases that I've already explained. For example, the allotriomorphic ferrite and perlite and Wiedmerstein ferrite and the various forms of bainite and martensite. And we've gone through the theories for the growth of each of these phases. And of course, they have to nucleate as well. Uh, but those theories, uh, for example, for growth, describe the growth of an individual particle. Whereas in order to construct a time temperature transformation diagram, you actually need to be able to calculate the volume fraction of each of these phases. OK, so today's focus is on combining uh, nucleation and growth theory in order to produce a volume fraction as a function of time, temperature, alloying elements, and so forth. Uh, and I won't cover again the theory that we've done for growth, but focus on how we deal with volume fraction. So imagine that we have, um, uh, uh, we are observing a system, okay? Particles will nucleate at certain times, and they will then grow, and sometimes they will touch each other, and that we call hard impingement. And if there is a diffusion field around each of these particles, then as the particles grow, we will begin to uh, get contact of their diffusion fields, and the average composition of whatever solute we are thinking about will actually rise in the austenite. So the gradient uh, of concentration at a growing particle is sharpest before the far field composition has begun to change. And then it becomes gentle. So in fact, the growth rate will slow down once we get the overlap of diffusion fields. And that is known as soft impingement because these particles haven't actually touched each other, but they are still beginning to feel each other's presence. Uh, so we are going to deal with all of these aspects today. And I'm going to just introduce the elements of uh, nucleation theory next. So let's imagine that we are forming a new particle inside the austenite, and it is in the shape of a sphere uh, with a radius r. And if this is the free energy of austenite, and this is the free energy of ferrite, and we have supercooled it below this equilibrium temperature, so we have that much driving force available the chemical free energy change. So if I multiply delta G chem by the volume, because this is the free energy change per unit volume, then I get a term here, which is four upon three pi r cubed into this delta G. But generally speaking, there will be some strain energy because the density, for example, of this particle may be different from that of the austenite. Uh, so that opposes transformation. Uh, this term has a negative value, whereas this has a positive value. So strain energy per unit volume multiplied by the volume of the particle. And most importantly, we also have, are creating a new interface. Uh, and if sigma is the interfacial energy per unit area, and we multiply by the surface area of this particle, then that gives us the cost of creating the interface between the parent and product phases. So this term favors transformation. These two terms oppose transformation because they require additional free energy. Now, if I take this equation and I differentiate it with respect to the radius of the particle, then we get uh, something like this. And we set this equal to zero to find this maximum value here, uh, which corresponds to the critical size of the nucleus R star and the activation energy for nucleation G star. So at first, uh, even though we are below the equilibrium transformation temperature, because this term varies with R squared, whereas this term varies with R cubed, when R is small, this is the dominant term, and therefore we get an increase in free energy. Okay, 
And the amount of increase that we get scales with the interfacial energy. If, if this was zero, there would be no need for nucleation at all, right? So uh, we have uh, an activation energy for nucleation, G star, uh, which varies with the cube of the interfacial energy and the square of terms like the chemical free energy and the strain energy terms, okay? So the smaller the interfacial energy, G star is very sensitive to interfacial energy, the smaller will be our activation energy for nucleation. So this is the basic theory, and I've made uh, a lot of assumptions. Uh, for example, that we have a spherical shape. Uh, it's never going to be spherical in solid state uh, because of um, anisotropy. And also that uh, we have a single interfacial energy surrounding the whole particle that obviously won't be true if we have anisotropy and so on. But these are uh, complications which can be taken into account. The biggest problem is not really those complications, but what do we use for the interfacial energy per unit area? Is it different when the particle is small as opposed to when we are able to see it and so on? So very often, uh, this is a fitting parameter that you derive by measuring the number density of particles as a function of time. Because, you know, even impurities in the steel will influence this. Now, there is a second fitting parameter, because this is just talking about the nucleation of a single particle, but there will be a number density of particles per unit volume. Okay, so number density of nucleation sites per unit volume, uh, and those could be, you know, austenite grain boundaries, dislocations, inclusions, whatever. But we need to have that information. And very often it's not possible to get that information. So this is the second fitting parameter that's usually used in nucleation theory. And this is an attempt frequency for getting over this barrier. The, the, if you are watching the system uh, so that we can see the atoms, then every so often a cluster of atoms will tend to adopt the product structure and composition, in which case, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, an embryo. Once that embryo grows beyond the critical size, we call it a nucleus, okay? So this attempt frequency is simply the fluctuations which are tending to take the cluster of atoms over the barrier. Uh, so this is the probability here, exponential minus g star upon kt, of making it over the barrier. So this, this frequency might be, you know, 10 to the power of 10, but we don't get 10 to the power of 10 per second of nuclei because there's a certain probability of those embryos making it over the barrier. And q is another activation energy, which is a constant, uh, for the transfer of atoms across the interface. So this is the basic theory for uh, nucleation rate per unit volume. And, you know, you can make it as sophisticated as you like. But it has thermodynamics and it has kinetics in it. So now we want to combine, uh, combine these parameters, the nucleation rates and the growth rates, in order to obtain the volume fraction. But we've got to deal with the problem of hard impingement, and I'll illustrate hard impingement uh, differently now. So here we are baking some cookies, okay? Uh, and this is the dough, and we start the baking process. These actually expand, okay? So in, in other words, these cookies become bigger, and eventually they will touch each other. And they obviously can't grow through each other, each other. And how do we treat this problem of hard impingement? Uh, we can't simply add up the nucleation rates and the growth rate and get a volume fraction because at some point the particles will touch each other. Well, you know, this was actually solved by uh, Avrami and Johnson and Mel and Kolmogorov many, many decades ago, where they said, OK, let's make the assumption that we let the particles grow through each other. OK, so even though that is physically impossible, we will let them grow through each other. And then we can calculate a volume fraction very easily because we can just ignore the impingement problem. Uh, all we do is we have a number density of nucleation 
particles that have nucleated, there's a certain growth rate, and we simply add up the volumes of these particles and divide by the total volume to get the volume fraction. And obviously, you know, that is going to be wrong. So how do we correct that? So imagine that at a time t we have these two particles, and a short time later they become bigger. Okay, the delta t later they become bigger, and we may actually nucleate other particles in that time interval delta t. So here are two new particles which have nucleated. Uh, this one is contributing to transformation, but this one is impossible because it's actually formed in a region that is already trans. Uh, transformed. So if I add up one, two, three, and four particles, I will get the wrong change in the volume fraction. And that's called an extended volume because we are ignoring the fact that we have nucleated a particle in a transformed region. Okay. So this is the wrong change in volume fraction, uh, dv extended. And this is the real change in volume fraction because we just take the total one, two, three, and four particles, and we multiply by the probability of finding untransformed material. So that effectively corrects for this uh, particle forming inside a transformed region. We are simply scaling our wrong, but easy to calculate change in volume fraction by the probability of finding untransformed austenite. Uh, and therefore, the relationship between these, uh, these two quantities is easily obtained by integrating this uh, equation, that the true volume fraction, the volume of all the alpha particles divided by the total volume, is equal to one minus exponential of the incorrect volume of alpha divided by the total volume. And this exponential comes from the fact that when I take this bracket onto the left-hand side, we have... Uh, an equation like dx over x. So it will be log of x versus uh, an extended volume. And when I unlog that, I get the exponential term. So this is a, a really beautiful uh, treatment of the hard impingement problem. Okay? So we can basically calculate the volume fraction as if the particles are growing through each other and are free to nucleate even in transform region. That gives us the wrong volume fraction. And then we correct it by multiplying the term with the probability of a newly transformed region falling into an untransformed area. So this is known uh, uh, commonly as uh, Avrami theory, but it was simultaneously, uh, you know, almost simultaneously derived by Johnson and Mel and Kolmogorov in uh, Russia might have been the first one. Okay. So we are observing a system that is transforming, and at the time tau one, we have a particle, okay, which is nucleated, and then let's assume it's growing at a constant growth rate, then this is the trajectory its dimension would follow. But in the meantime, you know, another particle will form at time tau two, and this one has actually grown, and, and so on. So the volume of a particle that has nucleated at a particular value of the time tau is simply the volume uh, of a sphere uh, with the time uh, t minus tau because the particle doesn't exist before it nucleates, all right? And this is the uh, velocity, growth velocity, which I've assumed to be constant. So this is the volume of a particle that has formed at a particular value of time uh, given by tau 2, tau 3, or whatever. Uh, and the change in extended volume in that time interval between tau and tau plus d tau is given by the number of particles that we expect to nucleate in this time interval, nucleation rate per unit volume multiplied by the total volume, and then the volume of each particle that has formed in this interval. Okay, so this is the change in the extended volume of alpha. And we scale it now with the probability of finding the particle in an untransformed region. So it's simply this equation uh, multiplied by this probability term to get the real change in volume fraction. And uh, I'm going to represent volume fraction as the volume of alpha divided by the total volume. 
uh, and then integrate this, and we get the famous uh, Avrami equation, where the volume fraction is psi, one minus exponential, the velocity cubed, the nucleation rate, and time to the power of four. So this equation actually contains everything because the velocity and the nucleation rate depend on thermodynamics and therefore on your alloying elements and the undercooling below the equilibrium temperature and contains time and is for isothermal transformation. And I explained to you that I made the assumption of a constant velocity and a constant nucleation rate but all of those can be as complicated as you like. You could have, for example, anisotropic growth rates, uh, or you could have a nucleation rate uh, which changes with time and so on. The values of these exponents will be different, but we've taken full account of the impingement problem, okay? Okay, so if I plotted this curve, uh, it, would, it would give me these sigmoidal forms, all right? And the reason is that at first, there's plenty of untransformed material. So the rate of reaction increases. Okay? And then it starts to decrease again as we run out of the parent phase. Okay? Uh, so we get a curve which is sigmoidal in shape. Now, if I, uh, if I plot the volume fraction of transformation, let's assume that we can change this uh, strain into a volume fraction at an isothermal temperature, then that simply gives me our classic time temperature transformation diagram. So if I supercool the austenite here, it takes that much time for the reaction to start and then progress and then complete. Okay, So that's how a time temperature transformation diagram um, can be generated using theory. The rates uh, in this case for a particular C curve here, the rate is slow when you're close to the equilibrium temperature because the driving force is small. And then the rate is slow at a lower temperature because diffusion is slow. Okay? Now the interpretation of these curves, of course, depends on the mechanism of transmission. So we have a set of curves where you have diffusion and a set of curves where you have a displacive mechanism of transmission, which are at a larger undercooling because of the dominant role of strain energy. So for many years now, it's been possible to calculate time temperature transformation diagrams as a function of the alloying elements. So for example, here, uh, if this is a, a plane, oops, sorry. Uh, so for example, here, if this is a plain carbon steel, uh, this would be the time temperature transformation diagram, the red one that we would obtain, extremely fast transformation kinetics, okay? Um, you know, this is in uh, one second here, and this is, sorry, this is one second and this is 10 seconds. As we add alloying elements, we might accelerate the transformation or we might retard it depending on how the solute influences the free energy difference between austenite and perite. But one thing I want you to notice is that the diffusional C curves are much more sensitive to the alloying elements than the displacive C curves. Uh, bearing in mind that this is a log logarithmic scale, the change from here to here is very large compared with the change from here to here. And the reason is that both of these C curves are influenced by thermodynamics, how the alloying elements change the relative stabilities of austenite and ferrite but only the diffusional C curve is affected by the need for these elements to partition between the parent and product phases. And that slows them down much more than the displacive transformations, okay? Okay, so these are isothermal transformation diagrams. And in real life, uh, in other words, in industry, uh, we do not, or very, very rarely produce steels by isothermal transformation. Instead, they are produced by continuous cooling transformation, and you, you may get a whole mixture of transformation products. So this is a high carbon steel, and we have some uh, 
protractor cementite forming here. We have perlite forming. We have these dark plates, which are bainite. The lighter regions are martensite. And you even have clusters of white plates, uh, white plates, which are Wiedmannstein ferrite. So these transformations are not happening in isolated temperature ranges. They are all progressing as we cool the material. They're happening simultaneously. And the classical theory by Kolmogorov and uh, Avrami and Johnson and Mel only deals with one transformation at a time. And that is not appropriate for either continuous cooling transformation or transformation which is isothermal where you get more than one transformation product. So for example, Weedmann-Staden ferrite and grain boundary ferrite, a lot of ferrite. They form at the same temperature. So how do we modify the classic theory uh, for many transformations happening at the same time? So imagine now that we have two transformation products, alpha and beta. So at a particular time period, I've nucleated two alpha particles and they have grown to this size. And uh, sorry, they're, they're, uh, they are of this size. And a short time interval later, you know, these two particles have grown. And we have also nucleated two particles of beta. Obviously, this is not possible because it's formed in inside already transformed material, but that's not an issue. You know, we can we can correct uh, by multiplying by the probability of finding untransformed material, but this time taking care to include both alpha and beta in this simple equation. But more than that, we need two of these equations, one for the alpha phase and the other for the beta phase. And we have to solve these equations simultaneously. And it's very easy to do that in a numerical procedure. Uh, because then you can also take account of uh, any changes in the composition of the parent phase as transformation progresses. And if you have six transformation products, <coughs> then you have six of these equations which you solve simultaneously using a numerical procedure. And you get, uh, you know, curves like this, where this is the total amount of transformation this is the amount of alpha and this is the amount of beta. So notice that they are forming simultaneously. Okay? They're both increasing volume fraction at the same time. They're happening at different rates. Uh, and that is natural if they have different mechanisms of transformation. But they are forming simultaneously. Whether it's continuous cooling or isothermal transformation, uh, you can now treat the evolution of microstructure, no matter how many phases are forming at the same time. Now, this is interesting because, uh, you know, the question arose in an earlier lecture, how do we control the amount of Wiedmannstein ferrite? So these calculations that I'm showing you uh, are consistent with experimental data and they use this simultaneous transformation theory to allow a lotromorphic ferrite, Wiedmannstein ferrite, this is a lotromorphic ferrite, Wiedmannstein ferrite and perlite to form at the same time. We are not saying that, look, perlite start at this temperature, ferrite start at this temperature, and Wiedmannstein at another temperature. They are all allowed to form, and thermodynamics and kinetics determine which one dominates. Okay, So let's first of all look at this small austenite grain size, because obviously, you know, the austenite grain size is important, it allows uh, nucleation at grain boundaries, and there are other consequences which I'll show you later. If I have a, a cooling rate which is uh, 11 uh, Kelvin per minute, uh, then I first form a lot of allotomorphic ferrite. So this is almost 70% here, okay? And there is no Wiedmannstein ferrite, only perlite forms uh, when an appropriate uh, condition for the Hulkren region in the extrapolated phase boundaries is satisfied. However, if I increase the cooling rate, then I do get Wiedmannstein ferrite. And you know, notice that the amount of allotomorphic ferrite, which is the first one to form, okay, so that's very important, uh, 
it starts at a higher temperature, it's the first one to form, is actually uh, quite small, it's about 50%, and there is room within the austenite for Wiedemann-Stein ferrite plates to form. Okay, And finally, we get perlite. So this was a 30 micrometer austenite grain size. Here we have a 100 micrometer austenite grain size, and you can see even at this slow cooling rate, we are able to generate uh, Wiedemann-Staten ferrite. And that is because with a large austenite grain size, you cut down the grain boundary nucleation uh, because the number density of uh, austenite grain boundary sites per unit volume decreases if you increase the austenite grain size. And therefore, we have Wiedemann-Staten ferrite. And at a higher cooling rate, you know, Wiedemann-Staten ferrite is dominant. So uh, one of the effects of austenite grain size is that if you cut down the number density of grain boundary nucleation sites, then other transformations which uh, are prominent, uh, if you have lots of austenite available, for example, Wiedemann-Staden ferrite or intragranularly nucleated ferrite, will be able to form. But if you have a small austenite grain size, uh, if you have a large austenite grain size with reduced nucleation rate at the grain surfaces, uh, then you will get lots and lots of Wiedemann-Stern ferrite. And you can even uh, add boron, because boron will reduce the effect of grain boundary nucleation. Uh, and at a 30 micrometer grain size, you will start to get Wiedemann-Stern ferrite in this region. Okay? So anything that kills nucleation at the austenite grain surfaces will help other transformation products than ferrite to form. Now, there is a second effect, which uh, is not clear from this diagram, but I will show you. So, uh, imagine we have a large austenite grain size and a small austenite grain size. And the cooling conditions are such that you form a layer of ferrite at the grain boundary, completely decorating the grain boundary, and the same thickness of that layer in the small grain size. Then it's interesting that the volume fraction of ferrite for the same thickness is much smaller with a large austenite grain size than with a small austenite grain size. Now, what does that mean? That means that the amount of carbon that is partitioned into the austenite in this case is much less than the amount of carbon partitioned here. And carbon, of course, stabilizes austenite, so you're not going to allow nucleation happening inside the grains. So for this scenario, uh, because uh, we have a small volume fraction of ferrite and less enrichment of the austenite, it's intragranular nucleation that dominates the total volume fraction. If you reduce the grain size, the situation reverses and grain boundary nucleation dominates because you have enriched this austenite enormously even though the thickness of the layer here is the same, the volume fraction of ferrite is much greater. So if you want to achieve more Wiedemann-Stern ferrite, there are two things. One is that you have a large austenite grain structure. Uh, the second thing is that you do something to suppress austenite grain boundary nucleation, for example, small concentrations of boron, uh, and, of course, um, the third thing uh, is if you have intragranular nucleation sites. Now, uh, this kind of theory is not just useful for dealing with the major phases in our material. You can also calculate the sequence of carbide precipitates, uh, for example, in creep-resistant steels. Uh, creep resistant steels or steels containing many different kinds of carbides such as molybdenum carbide or M23C6 or M7C6 and so on. So I'm going to give you a case study now. Uh, we were working on a project to create uh, steel structures which are located on the seabed. Okay? And these structures uh, are made usually from a steel called F22, which essentially is two and a quarter chrome, one moly, and 0.158% carbon. And it's a very well established steel. Uh, but the oil companies needed 
another stronger steel, which still has toughness, weldability, many other parameters, and very importantly, hydrogen embrittlement resistance. Okay, And these structures are really quite large. So we are talking about huge components, uh, you know, weighing, uh, weighing tons. So your steel must have sufficient hardenability to transform uniformly into the required structure. So the first thing you have to do is a finite element analysis of the uh, say say you ostentize this large component and you allow it to cool in air because you know you're not going to use forced air cooling or water quenching because these are huge components uh, so you allow it to cool in air then you need to know the thermal history at every single point in your component and that is uh, fairly standard to do using finite element analysis okay so we did that and Secondly, uh, you know, all the transformations uh, at every location will actually happen during continuous cooling, not uh, not isothermal uh, transformation in any sense of the word. All right. So we've got to be able to convert calculated time temperature transformation diagrams into continuous cooling transformation diagrams. So the way we did that, and you know, there are approximations involved in this is this is our isothermal transformation diagram for different volume fractions. Uh, let's say we pick this particular volume fraction, which is 0 0.05. We divide this continuous cooling curve into isothermal steps. Right? So this is, if you like, the time taken isothermally to form 5%. But we've only spent this much time at this uh, temperature. So the amount that we have achieved is delta T, uh, Ti divided by Ti. Right? Uh, we, we won't get 5% in this time interval, but the thermal activation has had time delta Ti over Ti. And then we add up all these steps, uh, delta T1 divided by T1, delta T2 divided by T2, and so on. And when that sum reaches a value of one, we have achieved 5% transformation. And then you can do the same thing for the other curves. So this is a, a Schall method. And you know, it has assumptions, but it's a, it's a good way of uh, doing um, calculations in the first place and then validating experimentally. Now, how, uh, so, so you can design the steel based on these principles to achieve uh, the sort of bainitic microstructure that was required, which would then be severely tempered because uh, when you use it, it is in a much more stable condition than when it has transformed into bainite, uh, etc. And the purpose of the heat treatment also is to induce uh, carbide precipitation, alloy carbide precipitation, uh, typically, you know, M6C, M2C, uh, and uh, M23C6. Uh, but we wanted, uh, we wanted to make this steel hydrogen resistant because when you increase the strength of a material, the difficulty of hydrogen embrittlement becomes greater. Uh, the reason is very simple, that hydrogen has to be able to diffuse in order to embrittle, right? But the concentration inside the steel is very small, you know, less, usually less than one part per million. So when a crack happens, there is a stress field at the crack which attracts the hydrogen so that it can concentrate to a much higher level. And that is when embrittlement sets in. OK, so. If you can stop the hydrogen from diffusing, then you can stop hydrogen embrittlement. And the way to do this was uh, was by introducing particular carbides which have coherency strain fields around them, which trap the hydrogen and stop it from diffusing to a crack. And this idea is not actually new. Uh, you know, uh, Nippon Steel did this uh, many, many decades ago for bolting steels which are used, you know, very large bolts used uh, to hold together bridges. 
and they showed that uh, static failure due to hydrogen ingress basically stops okay by introducing vanadium molybdenum carbides and here are the carbides that we introduced in our our steel and the procedure you know to design a new steel is as follows first of all you know the engineers must tell you exactly what they want all right it's very very important to spend time with the people who actually use the equipment and design the equipment to know what parameters they require. Because if you don't do that, you might miss something and then you have to start again. And of course, we can't manufacture things exactly to exact composition. So you have to identify that when you scale up, what are the practical limits to the control of composition and processing? Okay. And then you throw a whole load of modeling tools. Now, these tools are not perfect because they don't address the level of complexity consistent with steels, but they help you to get towards the uh, solution in an accelerated time period. Right? So using all these models, you then specify a composition and processing and tolerances, and then you make 200 grams of steel. OK, that, see, that is very small compared with, you know, what you will eventually end up with. Uh, so these are samples of uh, 70 grams each of experimental alloys, which we homogenize, anneal and swage into longer pieces so that we can do lots of experiments and basic characterization, for example, uh, hardness, microscopy, uh, small mechanical tests, phase transformation, kinetics measured using dilatometry. Uh, and if, if things are going in the right direction, then you would proceed to make a larger quantity where you can do, you know, proper mechanical testing. But if you haven't succeeded, you should go back to this, okay, and see what went wrong. And that can actually inform the development of uh, modeling tools. You know, why didn't they give us a good enough prediction? So let's assume that we managed out of these three different alloys that we made, we, one of them has achieved the right set of uh, parameters. So 100 kilograms of steel and uh, do, you know, tests such as uh, um, slow strain rate, hydrogen embrittlement tests, um, toughness, weldability, and many other experiments that you can do with 100 kilograms of steels. And you can subject this now to advanced characterization methods, which you can't do with small samples. If everything goes well, then industry has to come in a big way and spend a lot of money to make 10,000 kilograms of steel to actually make a component, right? So th this would be extended validation where you look at all parts of the component, you make a component, you break it up into bits and pieces and examine, uh, and you need component level testing. So this now becomes incredibly expensive. So the cost of this stage is far, far greater than all of these, far greater, okay? So the amount of money you spend on research in a university is actually far smaller than what you need to validate a component for implementation. Because, you know, if something goes wrong on the seabed, that is far more costly than spending time and money to characterize a component. So just to summarize, I will show you a movie which was made by BP. Deep water development is a very, very important part of BP upstream business. The reservoirs that have not been yet exploited tend to be high pressure, high temperature, and quite often they are also deeper uh, water depth. So far we were exploiting reservoirs up to 15 psi pressure. So within BP, we have project 20K, which is aiming at accessing reservoir with a 20K side pressure. This poses a challenge in terms of the mechanical properties of the equipment. We need to have material that can withstand all this, uh, this, this environment. There's a limit to how strong the material can be. We have reached this limit, and now what we need is to go stronger. And there's just nothing that exists at the moment for this harsh air condition. So if we want to be able to access new reservoir, we will need new materials.
One of the most exciting projects is the hydrogen embrittlement. We are after strong materials. Strong materials are particularly sensitive to hydrogen. Hydrogen will enter the steel by one way or another. Corrosion is an electrochemical process on components which are submerged. And if you put a current which reverses that process, then you stop corrosion. Then the hydrogen gets in. And even though the concentration of hydrogen might be one part per million, that has a dramatic effect on the mechanical properties of the steel. So the goal is to design a way of capturing any hydrogen that gets into the steel and stopping it from migrating to regions where it would do harm. We have quantitative mathematical models which allow us to address some of the variables. But these models are not sufficiently sophisticated. So what we do then is we make about 60 grams of material and we assess whether the models are in the right direction. After the computer modeling, we create our first melt composition. What I got here is a mixture of pure element. What Kelvin is doing now is to melt all these elements together and mix it all up. We're going to perform a heat treatment and then we cut it all up. One piece is to go for chemical composition measurement, the other to be measure the hardness. This equipment will separate out the hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen and then we can measure the amount of hydrogen inside the steel. When we first realized one of the alloy work to the specification, I'm very excited, but you know that more work has to be done. Things look good. We have demonstrated we can not only trap the hydrogen, but actually reduce the motion of hydrogen through the steel. It's great when there's a good result. It's terrific, but until we go to the nine ton component, we cannot actually risk saying that this is successful. But the point is, you know, the indicators are all in the right direction. All new ways of making materials have evolved. To really make innovative research advances, you need to bring something new, a new technique, a new approach. It's an enabler, so if we haven't got this alloy, we don't have the technology to exploit our share condition reservoir. The ICAM project is uh, focusing on the fundamental science, and sometimes it's a bit difficult to, to see from an industrial perspective, the interest of doing fundamental science. All the academics I've worked with have shown really excellent expertise, very brilliant people focusing on developing engineering solutions. In 10 years' time, when this alloy will be available on the market and will enable access to new reservoirs, then we can look back at all the work done in ICANN and think that well, it was worthwhile.